Welcome to Government Contracting Weekly, sponsored by AOC Key Solutions Incorporated. Government Contracting Weekly is the only television program devoted exclusively to the competitive and dynamic world of government contracting. A world where coming in second place is not an option, but where principled-centered winning is the only approach. Good morning and welcome to Government Contracting Weekly. I'm Jim McCarthy, the owner of Key Solutions and the host of this show. Today's program begins with a conversation that I recently had with John McCarthy, no relation by the way, and John Baker, who are partners at the law firm of Crow and Mooring. They are experts in the ever more complex yet critical area of data rights and intellectual property. After this discussion, you'll meet John Pagliatello, the president of the Business Coalition for Fair Competition. Now there's a lot to cover, so let's get right to it. John McCarthy, partner at Crow and Mooring, member of the Government Contracts Group Steering Committee, 20 years litigation experience, representing both large and small companies. And prior to 1989, he designed and developed computer and communication systems and equipment for IBM, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and others. Jonathan Baker, counsel in government contracts at Crow and Mooring, uh, experience with a uh, focus on data rights, patents, and intellectual property. Uh, expertise in bid protests with an impressive uh, set of wins before GAO and has served as a officer in the United States Air Force. Gentlemen, good morning. Welcome to Government Contracting Weekly. We're glad you're here. Good morning. John and John. Good morning. Now, I don't know what the rule is here. We got two McCarthys and two Johns, so <laughs> somehow we've got it all uh, sewed together here. But what we want to do, first of all, is start with the subject of intellectual property. And I have to tell you, when, when I go to sleep at night, that's the one topic I like to read about because it is so <laughs> fascinating. So tell us intellectual property, why is it important for the typical contractor to understand these issues? Why don't we start with you, John? Certainly. Yeah. So, so um, when you look at the uh, federal government, the federal government provides a, a great business opportunity for many contractors uh, and many companies that, that uh, want to expand their businesses. And so for those companies that are looking at doing business with the government, in particular research and development business with the government, you need, really need to understand uh, what, the, what the rules are that, that apply to those government contracts and uh, intellectual property. And so in, in that sense, it's, it's, um, it, it provides a great business opportunity. Um, that said, uh, and uh, as I'm sure we'll talk about uh, as the show goes on, there are um, lots of restrictions and regulations that govern the, the various intellectual property rights. Mm -hmm. um, companies oftentimes will have, uh, their intellectual property is really um, their, um, their, their, oftentimes is their main capital, mm -hmm. right? And they want to protect that. And so they need to go into doing business with the government mm -hmm. uh, with their eyes open. I see, okay. Well, John McCarthy, why don't we follow up on that? Uh, is there some issue in intellectual property that is particularly hot and raging nowadays? Yeah, I think the big thing nowadays is, is sort of the shift in, in the government's uh, view with respect to intellectual property. Historically, the government uh, was not as grabby as, shall we say, with respect to intellectual property rights. They let contractors develop, perform the research and development, and develop uh, and retain the intellectual property. More recently, the, the pendulum has been shifting a little bit, and the government is looking for long savings and long-term sustainment and repairs associated with major systems. And they're looking to acquire intellectual property rights so they can compete more uh, of the sustainment and repair. It sounds like you're saying that the, uh, the government has sort of shifted its emphasis on intellectual property over the last couple of years. Is, is that a correct assessment on my part? What do you think, I, John Baker? I would say it's been, um, it, it, it started before a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. It's been over the last several years. Um, I, I would say historically, um, I would say going back to perhaps the, the 1990s uh, with the stories of the $500 hammers mm -hmm. and, and things that we oftentimes saw in the news, um, the government at that particular time was really focused on uh, buying more as a co commercial customer. They wanted to be treated like a commercial, mm -hmm. commercial customer, com customer so that they could take advantage of the various uh, economies of scale that come along with that. Now with that, um, 
as an extension, at that period of time, if, if they're buying as a commercial customer, they typically were receiving rights uh, in, in contractors' um, intellectual property that were consistent with what the contractors were giving to their commercial customers. Right. As time has passed, though, as John mentioned, the pendulum has swung a bit, and so over the past few years, you have seen the government being, I would say, increase, increasingly assertive in obtaining greater intellectual property rights mm -hmm. through their contracts, mm -hmm. um, and as well as enforcing the rights um, that already exist under their existing contracts. Okay. In, among our audience are a lot of uh, companies that want to begin to do business with the mm -hmm. federal government. Right now, they're commercial uh, operations for the most part. And so there's a difference, I suspect, between the commercial model and the government model when it comes to IP. So I was wondering if, uh, if John McCarthy, if you don't mind, can you uh, sort of elaborate on that for us? Yeah, first of all, for, for commercial com companies, there's tremendous opportunities. There's a lot of federal R&D budget money that is available potentially for commercial contractors at, to, uh, to buttress their R&D budgets. So that's available out there. It's a carrot out there. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem is if you're going to take that carrot, there's rules that go with that carrot. And there's very detailed rules. And as long as you know those rules and know how to play the game, you can go through that process. You can take advantage of that additional investment and still come out at the end of the day with a solid set of intellectual property rights that you can use to leverage your commercial products. So there's some lessons that can be learned from the commercial model that are applied to government and vice right. versa. That think. said, yeah. in the commercial marketplace, commercial vendors are used to defining their rules and saying these are the rules of the game, you play by our rules. Right. When you're dealing with the United States government, it's the United States government that sets the rules. And you have to know those rules and you have to play in accordance with those rules or you risk essentially waiving significant intellectual property rights okay. to the United States government. Thank you. One question real quick. Who's the better attorney? <laughs> no. We're, we're going to step away now and take a break. When we come back, we'll continue our discussion on intellectual property and data rights. So did we win that government contract? We did. And? And now we've got to deal with the regulatory hurdles. <laughs> well, good luck with that. When the government's your client, you need to play by their rules. Oh, and the rules change more than you think. Exactly. We need someone who's done this before. Plus, it's complicated, so we're going with BDO. BDO? Hmm. People who know government contracting know BDO. Since 1941, the USO has been lifting the spirits of America's troops and their families. Members of our military continue to make sacrifices and defend our nation. That's why the USO of Metropolitan Washington, Baltimore is committed to serving them throughout their years of service. USO Metro is the way for you to say thanks to our local military members, their families, and our wounded warriors and caregivers. Please visit us at usometro.org. We're back now with John McCarthy and John Baker, both of the law firm Crow and Mooring, and we're talking about intellectual property and data rights. And before commercial, uh, John McCarthy, we were talking about the differences between a commercial model and the uh, government model. So in, when it comes to transactions, can you elaborate on what are the differences? Here? Yeah, there's a couple of macro level issues that, that commercial vendors need to keep in mind. One is they have to keep track of the stuff that the government invests in, where the government puts their money and differentiate that from the stuff they developed at private expense. The difference is the government gets greater rights in the stuff they invest in. And secondly, the second big issue is when you're dealing with the government, when you provide technical data, manuals, or software to the government, you have to mark those manuals or data or software, or otherwise you risk waiving valuable intellectual property rights. And uh, so a contractor has to be careful to have systems in place to make sure 
that they want track who pays for what, and secondly, mark what they get. Would the money. rules be different if it were under a cost type contract versus a firm fixed price with respect to the ownership of, let's say, uh, intellectual property or what, something that's developed uh, on contract? It, it, it is because on a cost type contract, it's a little clear about who's paying for what. Mm -hmm. It, under firm fixed price contracts, it's, it's a little murkier. You still need to be careful about defining the scope of the work, but it is a little more difficult under, under a firm fixed price contract. But it, it is a difference, and a contractor under a firm fixed price contract has to be more careful. That's a, okay. Um, John Baker, your thoughts uh, on this whole subject of the differences between Cer the two? Certainly. The, the one additional difference I'll, I'll point out is that in, in some instances, uh, when you're when a contractor is selling a commercial item to the government, the government is still going to obtain certain license rights in, in that item. Um, those commercial those license rights will more closely resemble um, the contractor's com standard commercial license. Um, but when you're selling to the government, there are additional um, things that uh, that the contractors need to be aware of that. Um, that are going to be a little different than what um, are, are in their standard licenses. For example, indemnification clauses, those right. types of things, the government just by law cannot agree to. Right. There's some things they can't negotiate away, for Absolutely. example. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, John Baker, another question. Um, I've heard you say before that uh, when it comes to intellectual property, it begins long before signing the contract where you have to start working. You know, so what did, what did you mean by that? So what I meant by that is is essentially there are certain systems that you want to have in place to ensure that um, you're tracking, at, like John was talking about, you really need to understand the source of funding for a particular development effort. And so there's certain systems that you can have in place before a project even begins, mm -hmm. before you begin any development, and, and, and before you sign any government contract. Mm -hmm. With those systems in place, it's going to be much easier for contractors down the road to know ahead of time what their intellectual property risks are before they sign. This is why, with respect to commercial contractors, this is where a lot of them get in trouble, is they see this money out there for research and development where the government can invest in their, in their products, and they jump at it, they go out and sign the deal, and they get this government investment, and they don't have these systems in place that John mentioned. And they get through, and they call John and I up afterwards and say, we just took all this money from the government. Now the government's claiming they have these great rights in this this software, or this this uh, this widget we developed, and you know we have some sad news for them, unfortunately. Right, and so the problem began maybe essentially with commingling in the first place. Would that be a correct assessment? That would be correct. Yeah. That's right. Okay, let's talk a little bit about uh, what government contractors should do about all this. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, this show is, is about winning government contracts, and it doesn't make much sense to win a government contract and then lose your shirt somewhere else in this whole realm of inter, in, intellectual property. So talk to us about some tips or suggestions, please, on uh, what the contractors should do in this area of data rights and, and IP, please. Certainly. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I, I would say contractors should be proactive mm -hmm. about uh, tracking the, the source of funding. We've talked a, a bit about this uh, now. And, and by that I mean, when before you begin a development effort, uh, make sure that all the engineers that are going to be working on it know um, exactly what charge number to, to use for that effort uh, so that they can keep all those funds separate. Mm -hmm. even, yeah. even backing up from that, okay. uh, contractors need to know the rules of the game before they step on the playing field. Right. Okay? There's a lot of rules to this game. Uh, some are very complex, they're not very intuitive, some are very arcane, and some are very draconian. So the contractor, before he jumps into this government contracts pool, needs to know what he's getting himself into, and needs to prepare himself for those rules and have the, the, the systems in place, as John mentioned, to make sure that at the end of the day, it's not surprised by the fact that it's waived all its intellectual property rights. And it did so unaware because it didn't exactly. do its homework, like you're saying. Correct. Okay. Let's talk about myth busters. We hear a lot about that in the federal government. Is there one prevailing myth you think that exists between the, um, let's say, with the government contractors in this whole area? John McCarthy, what's your thought? Yeah, the, the big thing we always hear is, is, both from the government side and from the contractor paid side, is the government says, I paid for it, therefore I own it. That's simply not the case across the board, even where the government pays 100%. The government gets a license, and then the question is, what rights does, I mean, the government gets a license, and the scope, question is the scope of that license. So that's one of the big myths that, that's out okay. there. Um, and the, the, on the, the 
contractor side, the, the contractor believes that the fact that it paid for something and it gives it to the government just because it paid for it doesn't mean that it hasn't waived rights because it hasn't followed the rules. If it hasn't marked it, it may have waived its rights to the, that intellectual property even though it paid for 100 percent right. of it. So a message to our audience out here today is make sure that you get this intellectual property and data rights story correct because literally you could be betting the future of your company if things go wrong. Absolutely. Right. Okay, so we're about out of time. I want to thank uh, John Baker and, and John McCarthy, both from Crowell and Morgan, for being here this morning. You guys did great, and thank you for coming. Appreciate thank it. You thank you for having us. us. Okay, we're going to step away now for a uh, commercial break. AOC Key Solutions and the Government Technology and Services Coalition are pleased to announce that B3 Solutions, a company that delivers acquisition management and contract administration, information technology and security, program management, supply chain management and logistics, as well as systems engineering services, is a 2014 Mentor of the Year Award winner. Nominated by Supreme Solutions Incorporated, B3 has provided their mentee with business strategic planning, program management, technical support, and financial assistance on subcontracts. B3 has been a crucial asset in Supreme Solutions proposal responses and in developing project planning and matrix management. On behalf of the Government Technology and Services Coalition and AOC Key Solutions, congratulations to B3 Solutions. Questions. Do you lack win strategy themes and discriminators? Are you being outmaneuvered by your competition? Did you get a late start on your proposal? If you answered yes to one or more of these nightmare scenarios, we can help. Hi, I'm Jim McCarthy, owner of Key Solutions. We help government contractors win government contracts. And for over 30 years, KSI has helped clients win or retain over 130 billion in government contracts by providing the keys to winning. We assist companies both large and small to enter the U.S. government contracts market or to increase their market shares. We have worked with 87 of the top 100 government contractors and literally hundreds of small businesses. So if you're chasing a must-win contract opportunity, go to our website aockeysolutions.com and click on win. It's a tough market out there. Don't go it alone. John Pagliatello, President, Business Coalition for Fair Competition, or BCFC. FC is dedicated to free enterprise, relief from what it believes to be unfair government-sponsored competition, and maximum reliance by government on the private sector. John spent many years in the senior staff positions on the Hill, and he was a driving force in efforts to enact the Federal Activities Inventory Reform, or FAIR Act. John is also a charter member of the prestigious National Geospatial Advisory Committee. Good morning, and welcome to our show, and I'm glad you're here. So, thank you. Thank yeah, you for having and me. And I know our audience is looking forward to what you have to say. So let's start with a definition, if you will, your definition of unfair government-sponsored competition. What does that mean What in the context that your group stands for? Okay. We believe strongly in the Yellow Pages test, and that's a simple test that says if the government is doing something that you can also find from companies in private enterprise in the Yellow Pages of the phone book, then that is an activity that ought to be reviewed for potential private sector performance. That's the classic definition of a commercial activity that's performed by and within the government that uh, the private sector uh, can and probably so should if, do. So if the government is performing it itself and it's, it, quote, in the yellow pages, then your view is that that's not a proper uh, activity for the government? Correct, and right. at least ought to be reviewed for potential private sector performance. Okay. There's a lot of talk about uh, OMB Circular A76, which has a lot to do with outsourcing and so on like that. What, what is your definition of A76 program and how well is it working and what, what, what's the status at this point? Well, A76, in theory, is a wonderful program. Um, it has its origins, actually, back to the Eisenhower administration. It was first issued in, uh, before we had an OMB, we had a, a Bureau of the Budget, and before we had OMB circulars, we had Bureau of the Budget bulletins. And uh, there was Bureau of the Budget Bulletin 55-4. 
that was issued by President Eisenhower in 1955, and it established a federal policy that the government should not compete with its citizens, but rather should be relying on the private sector to the maximum extent practicable. Uh -huh. And that language remained in A76 until uh, President George W. Bush's administration did a revision to A76 and actually took that philosophical policy statement out. Um, but A76 is still a very useful tool for evaluating activities within the government and looking at potential savings and efficiencies by private sector well, is, performance. Is the A76 program currently in use? Is it, is it vibrant and active, or has it sort of gone silent for a while? It's gone silent because of Congress. There is a moratorium on conducting A76 uh, evaluations of federal activities mm -hmm. because of uh, legislation that has been enacted as part of uh, the defense bill and as part of an appropriations bill. So what is your remedy? What do you propose? We'd like to see that moratorium lifted. Mm -hmm. We think that uh, A76 type reviews uh, should be resumed, and particularly at this point in time, Jim, and here's why. We have a double whammy that federal managers are facing. You have sequestration on one hand, and then the handcuff of saying you can't do A76 on the other hand. So on one, uh, again, on one hand, Congress is saying you have to reduce spending, but yet they've said don't look for in a more efficient way to get an activity accomplished. Mm -hmm. your, your group also uh, s talks a lot about public-private partnerships, or P3s. What, what's your position on that, on that particular thing? We're in favor. Mm -hmm. I still use the term privatization. There's a lot of people who think that's a pejorative or it's an outdated term. But uh, to me, privatization is an umbrella term, and that includes outsourcing, it includes vouchers, it includes public-private competitions, it includes uh, public-private partnerships. There are a variety of different tools and strategies that could be used. We are actually creating a partnership between government and the private sector, rather than a competition or an adversarial mm -hmm. relationship. Okay, in, a, in the short time that we have remaining, what would you say is the recommendation that you would have regarding public-private partnerships, and what business opportunities lie in for, you know, for big and small businesses? Well, there's tremendous opportunity in the government for, for both large and small business. Under the uh, FAIR Act that you mentioned, the Federal Activities Inventory Reform Act that was passed by Congress in 1998, each year agencies are to inventory their commercial activities and identifying what, they're, what they do that are commercial in nature. Um, more than 850,000 federal employee positions fall within that category. So, so that's the market for so both large and small business. So that's the potential market businesses. for yes, contractors. Sir. Yes, right. sir. Well, thank you. We're going to take a break right now. Thank you, and we'll, we'll be right back. FCA has been bringing government and industry together since 1946. By joining FCA, you will reach the decision makers and become part of the discussion. You'll increase market visibility, gain market insight, receive discounts on FCA member services and events, and manage and engage corporate associates. FCA is the association of choice. Join today at www.fca.org. In this hyper-competitive marketplace, as a federal government contractor, now more than ever, you need to identify, track, forecast, and analyze opportunities that will help you grow your company by better positioning yourself to win contracts. I'm Jamie Brett, the founder of EasyGovOps, and that's our mission. Utilizing the most intuitive market intelligence platform, EasyGovOps, enables contractors of all sizes to manage their pipeline, collaborate, and team like never before. Experience for yourself the power available to you and your team with a five-day free trial period with no commitment necessary to begin. Simply visit easygovops.com to start your free trial today. Join the hundreds of other federal government contractors who are enjoying the ultimate competitive advantage of our unequaled market intelligence. Just spend one free week at easygovops.com and see for yourself. As you've seen from watching our show, we've begun to produce and air commercials. For advertisers, this is smart for a couple of reasons. First, there's no waste. Our audience is almost entirely contracting executives and procurement officers. 
Second, we include commercial production, and with KSI's $130 billion in wins, we know how to create the most impactful message. To learn more, contact us at governmentcontractingweekly.com and click on Advertise. Now, we're at that point of the time in our show where we like to hear from our viewers. So I'm going to now turn it over to Richard Nathan, President and CEO of AOC Key Solutions, and he's going to talk to us about the Government Contracting Weekly Mailbag. Richard. Good morning. Let's talk about red teams today. We're often asked for suggestions on how to rid this industry of the traditional, flawed red team process. And yes, we have strong ideas about that here at Key Solutions. At the very core of the idea is what we call a win team, which throws out the old adversarial culture of a red team and replaces it with a culture of support and help. In a win team, the members are asked to fix anything they can make stronger, including preparing first drafts of new or replacement sections, creating new figures, or making existing ones stronger. In other words, we put them on the same side of the table with the proposal team, making the proposal stronger and not across the table looking for weaknesses. Not only do they add positive value rather than tear things apart, but the morale of the proposal team soars, leading to a much better and more productive recovery down the stretch. At Key Solutions, we're all about helping you retain or win your next contract. If you have a question about review teams or anything else for that matter, please visit us at governmentcontractingweekly.com and click on inquiries at the top of the page. We'd be happy to get back to you. I want to thank our guests today, John McCarthy and John Baker, partners at the law firm of Crow and Mooring, for their comments on data rights and intellectual property. Also thanks to John Pagliatello, the president of the Business Coalition for Fair Competition. But most importantly, I want to thank you, our viewers, for once again making Government Contracting Weekly a regular part of your learning regimen. On behalf of all my colleagues at Key Solutions, I'm Jim McCarthy, and I'll see you next week. been watching Government Contracting Weekly, sponsored each week by AOC Key Solutions Incorporated. Government Contracting Weekly is the only television program devoted exclusively to the competitive and dynamic world of government contracting. For additional information, comments, questions, or suggestions, please write us at governmentcontractingweekly.com. <laughs>